Well, welcome everybody to our Easter service. Today, we embark on a journey through history, through logic, through the Bible, and through personal experience to see the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We want to explore this cornerstone of our faith. Imagine a world where the final word was death, where that was the end of the story, where hope became fleeting whispers and our faith seemed meaningless. This would be the case if there was no resurrection. Thankfully, this is not our reality. <laughs> our hope is secure because it's anchored in an undeniable historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And today, I felt led by the Holy Spirit to remind you, and for some of you for the first time, maybe convince you and prove to you that the resurrection actually happened, that it actually changed the course of human history that we are in 2024 A.D. Why did the calendar change? Because our Lord resurrected from the dead. So here's my big idea. Everything we believe as Christians hinges on the resurrection. It vindicates his teachings, validates his sacrifice, and vouches for his promise of life beyond the grave. We're banking everything on the resurrection. My whole life is at stake. My kids and my grandkids, my legacy, my income, I'm, I'm wagering it all that this event happened. And you might think, wow, that's precarious, or that, that makes me nervous, or that... No, I, I want you to rest assured, it's so proven, it is so sure it is so solid that you can too. You also can bet everything you have on this. And, and so let me show you. First, we're going to do a historical analysis. Historical documents and accounts outside the Bible confirm Jesus' resurrection. First, his crucifixion, death, and burial, but then his resurrection. This challenges skeptics of these events because they don't know what to do with these extra-biblical accounts. It's one thing that the Bible records it, which already is incredible history. These are, by the way, eyewitness testimonies. This is not just a religious text, and it's not just fairy tale. This is history. But even if you deny the eyewitness testimonies of the Scriptures, there's sources outside of the Bible that attest to these events. Josephus, the Jewish historian, in his work, Antiquities of the Jews, makes two references to Jesus, the most notable in the Testimonium Flavium, and he says that Jesus did wise deeds, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and was resurrected on the third day, believed by his followers who continued and called themselves Christians. Even the Babylonian Talmud refers to Yeshu, being hung on the eve of Passover on a tree. And this aligns with New Testament accounts, although the Talmud is a more hostile account opposed to Jesus. The historical reporting still confirms the crucifixion and the essence of Christian doctrine. Lucian, a Greek sat satirist, also mentions early Christians worshiping Jesus and and his life, death, and resurrection and signifying the impact of this. There's others I could go on and on. Roman Tacitus and Pliny the Younger. And There's external documents that attest to the various aspects of Jesus' life, not just the Bible. Some of these, although they don't detail the description of the resurrection like we do get in the eyewitness accounts of the disciples, they confirm that the disciples believed in their resurrection. So there was a belief, there was a doctrine that Jesus had 
come back from the dead, so much so it was transforming people, it was transforming communities, so much so that historians wrote it down and took note. Wow, these guys are changing and changing the world, and they all claim that this man came back from the dead. How are they all claiming this? So this bolsters the historic foundation of Christian beliefs. Also, the spread of Christianity. Let's look at a historical analysis of this way. How does a Jewish man who was a poor carpenter, blue-collar worker for 30 years, who then did three years of ministry, who never went more than 30 miles outside of his hometown, who had 12 followers, who was brutally murdered and executed on a Roman cross, And by the way, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people crucified by multiple different empires, and you never hear about them. In all pragmatic wisdom, he should have been deleted from the pages of history. In the ash bin, dust, we never to hear of this man. And yet, this man has two billion worshipers today. He is the most revered and respected historical figure that's ever existed. How does this happen? And not only is he respected and admired and revered, he's worshipped as God. This is an outrageous claim that two billion people believe he's divine. Believe not just that he was sent by God, believe that he was God incarnate. That he died on the cross for our sins. He forgives us all who come and call on his name, and then he conquers death to show us it's not the end for those that place their faith in Christ. We too can be raised to new life and dwell with him forever. This is the gospel. This is what he teaches, and this is not only what he died for, but what many saints throughout the ages have died for. He's unparalleled. There is no peer in history. There is no religious teacher that you can even put on par with Jesus. Not one of them claimed to be God. Not one of them predicted their own death and resurrection and actually pulled it off. He stands alone. So don't let the enemy convince you that he's just a nice religious teacher. (laughs) The spread of Christianity the explosion in its early days, despite persecutions, it underscores the believer's genuine conviction that Jesus had come back from the dead. If you actually think about it historically, this is remarkable. Given its origins, it's a small group of, of Jewish, mostly blue-collar fishermen and, and tradesmen and then tax collectors. How, how did this ragtag bunch of Jewish men spread their ideology across a planet. How did this happen? Especially when it's tr- the, the enemies of such a message are trying to extinguish it. By the fourth century, it had become the dominant religion in the entire Roman Empire. Scholars like Rodney Stark, in The Rise of Christianity, he argues that such a rapid growth from a few hundred followers to the time, at the time of Jesus' death to millions three centuries later can only be explained if there was an earth-shattering historical event like the resurrection to galvanize such a movement. Archaeological co- corroboration. Look at these archaeological discoveries that confirm the New Testament descriptions of first century Judea. There was... Uh, the ossuary of Caiaphas. This is the high priest who tore his garments when Jesus was on trial before his execution. And they've actually found archaeological evidence supporting that high priest. They've, there's an entire dig site at the Pool of Bethesda that confirms some of the gospel accounts where Jesus healed a paralytic man. And there's even a Nazareth inscription in archaeology that was an imperial, this is crazy, an imperial edict from Rome that was... a against grave robbing. I mean, how popular was grave robbing that Rome had to make a law against it? Unless they feared a man might come back out of the grave and a legend might start. In their mind, it's a myth. In our mind, we know it's fact. 
But this is very interesting that the Roman Empire would make a law against this, which hints at the early spread of resurrection belief amongst Christians. Now, you're not going to find in archaeology any sort of evidence that says Jesus has raised from the dead specifically, other than the fact that they still can't find his body. But what you will find in archaeology is that it proves the gospel witness. It proves everything that you see in the gospel text they continue to find, which bolsters the witness of Matthew, of John, of Luke, of Mark. You you start to build more trust and credibility because you realize, wait, they said Caiaphas? Oh, there's actual archaeological evidence of Caiaphas. Lee Strobel, whom you guys might have heard of, he's a law school, uh, Yale law school graduate, and he authored the book, the case for Christ. He was a, a former investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife became a Christian, and he made it his mission to disprove Christianity. And he used those investigative journalist skills back when journalism was still journalism and not just opinion articles. And he began to research Christianity and the claims of Christ followers. And he determined, which he determined rightly, based off all the theologians and scholars that he was interviewing, that it all hinges on the resurrection. And that's why today I titled the sermon, The Resurrection, All or Nothing. Say it with me, all or nothing. And so he's determined to not just disprove Christianity, but to disprove the resurrection. If I can prove that it's a farce, if I can prove it's not real, then my, I can convince my wife and she'll stop being a Christian. <laughs> and I can convince the world. You might see where this is going. It didn't, it didn't work that way for Lee Strobel because this ultimately led to his conversion to Christ where he determined, he determined it takes more faith to be an atheist than to be a Christian. His story is detailed in his book where he examines the historical and the archaeological evidence for the resurrection. I want to just read you a quote. You might not be able to see the whole thing because it's a long quote, but bear with me as I read this. In addition to the scriptures, we also have the volumes of the writings of the apostolic fathers who were the earliest Christian writers after the New Testament. They authored the epistle of Clement, epistle of Ignatius, the epistle of Polycarp, the epistle of Barnabas, and others. In many places, these writings attest to the basic facts about Jesus, particularly his teachings, crucifixion, resurrection, and divine nature. The seven letters of Ignatius are among the most important of the writings as Ignatius was martyred during the reign of Trajan for emphasizing both the deity and humanity of Jesus. He also stressed the historical underpinnings of Christianity. He wrote in one letter on his way to being executed that Jesus was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate truly crucified and truly raised from the dead, and that those who believe in him would be raised too. When you put all this together, Josephus, the Roman historians, the Jewish writings, the apostolic fathers, the letters of Paul, and all of the disciples and the gospels of Jesus, and the corroborating archaeological findings, the evidence is simply overwhelming for the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a real historical event. This is an atheist who set out to disprove the resurrection and by the evidence was converted. We know it's the Holy Spirit drawing him. We know it was the witness of his wife. We know there's many factors, but think about this. Our faith isn't blind. Our faith is real. Everything we believe hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. It vindicates his teachings, validates his sacrifice, and vouches for his promise of life beyond the grave. Think about what I'm saying there in my big idea. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, why would we listen to his teachings? Because this man claimed to be God. He said he would die, and he said he would come back from the dead. So if he didn't come back from the dead, then he's crazy. why, Why even give credence to what he says? But if he does come back from the dead, we better listen to his teachings, right? It validates his sacrifice. Why? Because it means the check cleared. (laughs) 
right? He wrote a check with his life for all of your sin, all of my sin. And the check didn't bounce. It cleared. How do we know? Because hell spit him back out, right? It had to give the change. He overpaid. He was so righteous. He was so perfect that in paying for the sins of all humanity, hell had no grip on him, had no claim on him. Him conquering death reveals that he had the power to wipe away our sin. Being a human on the cross, he could represent our sin. Being God conquering death, he had the power to forgive and to conquer sin. And then lastly, it, it vouches for his promise. How, why does it vouch for his promise of life beyond the grave? Because he's been there before. He's not promising you something he doesn't know about. And let me tell you something, 10 out of 10 people die. It's a, it's a pretty strong statistic. Actually, there were these two guys, Enoch and Elijah, but we'll talk about them another time. Death is coming for us all, my friends. There's something I'm learning now as I'm getting to the, the middle years of my time here on earth. And that's that time goes quick. And kids grow up quick. And all of a sudden we're looking back on our life and the grave is ever coming closer for us. But rather than this, this haunting us, it should be a sober reality and wake-up call that we should probably figure out where we're going after we die. <laughs> and if we know who's been there before, we can have hope of everlasting life, then we don't have to fret. I also want to look at the logical analysis. Okay, so we've looked at some historical analysis. Let's just think about this logically. Let's just think through some of the rationale and some of the arguments that people use to disprove the resurrection. The first is the tomb. They say, well, the empty tomb. Um, it, it, couldn't ha it can't simply be empty because he, he rose from the dead. Uh, the disciples must have stole the body. Or maybe they had the wrong tomb. But when you go to the eyewitness accounts, you read that there were Roman guards standing watch. There was a Roman seal. I mean, it's as if God knew centuries later, millennium later, we would be debating this. He's like, you know what? Let's just make it really, really clear that these, these Jewish uh, disciples could not have overthrown Roman soldiers. Let's just, you know, let's post guards outside the tomb and let's put a seal. I mean, who seals a tomb? Unless you're trying to keep something in. in. <laughs> you keep it from getting out. And of course it didn't work. The bonds burst and the stone was rolled away. Why was the stone rolled away? Uh, think about this logically. Jesus, after he resurrects, the claims state, the, the documents tell us that he could walk through walls because he had a transfigured body. It was new. It was something else. It was interdimensional would be the actual scientific word. But he could also eat fish, so we know that it wasn't only spiritual. It was a physical, tangible body. It was just in our dimension and the heavenly dimension, and he was able to walk through walls and appear. So did he need the stone rolled away? It wasn't for him, because he could have just gone right through the stone. Why did, the, why did the angels roll it away? It's for us. It's for the critics. It's for the skeptic. It's for the part of you that's like, I don't know. I mean, gosh, this is a really extreme thing to believe that a man came back from the dead. And I could see the Father in heaven. Just, just roll away the stone. Just let them see. Right? It's for our sake that the stone is rolled away. Critics have uh, posited these, I would say, far-fetched theories about the wrong tomb or, like I said, the disciples stealing the body. Uh, N.T. Wright great New Testament theologian. He argues in the resurrection of the Son of God, these theories fail to account for Roman guards. They fail to account for the disciples' public ministries, right? It's not like they were sneaking around. Like, where would they hide this body? Anyone at any time could have said, hey, you, where's the body? I mean, because these guys started preaching openly and publicly about this resurrection. So at any time, they could have been tortured to hand over the body, and they never did. Think about that. And the failure for anyone, not just the disciples, to actually produce the body. They still haven't found it. The simplest explanation is Jesus came back from the dead. The disciples' transformation. How 
do these 12 followers and the 70 and also the 120, but primarily the 12, how do they go from hiding away from the Romans, scared Peter, denying that Jesus, he's, he's even associated with Jesus, to the world's boldest evangelists we've ever seen? How does that happen? At the cost of their lives, they staked their claim on the resurrection. J.P. Moreland, in Scaling the Secular City, he argues that this profound shift in the disciples, and also the Apostle Paul, which historians, secular historians, do not like to talk about the Apostle Paul, because this man went from killing Christians to making Christians, and the only thing in between is what he claims to have seen, which is the resurrected Christ. And so J.P. Moreland, he summarizes and concludes, which I think many of us do here in the room, that the only explanation of the disciples' transformation was they actually had an encounter with a real risen Lord. Now, you can debate whether they really saw it. You can debate that. I think there's evidence to show that they did. But what you can't debate historically is that they believed they saw it. They believed they saw it. So much so, I mean, they were so convinced that they would, even at the hands of being tortured and martyred, um, with their persecution of the enemies, they, they did not renounce. I mean, if it was a lie, why didn't they renounce the claim? And then the survival of Christianity against all odds and logical predictions. Christianity not only survived, it thrived. This points to the resurrection, right? There's, like we said before, there's persecution, there's fierce opposition, but also, guys, there's lack of connections, lack of resources. It's like God strategically set it up this way. He didn't convert the Roman emperor, emperor to start, right? He, I mean, this was a grassroots movement, no geopolitical, geopolitical power. They're actually an oppressed people group, and then this, but it still spreads, and it thrives, Alistair McGrath in Christianity's Dangerous Idea, he says that the resurrection was the pivotal belief that empowered the early church's resilience and witness. When you know with certainty what happens after you die, you can live your life with invincible courage. Guys, <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to explain why they were so courageous and so bold. They're like, what are you going to do? Kill me? I live forever. My Lord came back from the dead. You're going to do to me what you did to him? That didn't work out so well. Go ahead. I mean, these guys were so bold. Everything we believe hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. It vindicates his teachings. It validates his sacrifice. It vouches for his promise of life beyond the grave. Next, in chapter 3 of 4, so we're getting into the third quarter, I want to go into biblical analysis. You've seen historical, you've seen logical, biblical analysis. The first is we must recognize that Jesus' resurrection was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. As if there weren't already enough things stacking up for evidence. <laughs> Jesus knows we're going to question this, so he predicts his own death and resurrection, not just himself when he was on earth, but the prophets, thousands, hundreds, and sometimes even a thousand plus years before he was even born, the prophets were saying Messiah would come, God would come in the form of a man, and he would suffer, and he would die, and he would resurrect. In Psalm 16:10. David speaks about God not abandoning the Messiah's soul to Sheol, that's the grave, not abandoning it or letting his Holy One see corruption. This is such a powerful prophecy in Psalms that Peter quotes it in the book of Acts in one of his sermons. And, and the Jewish audience is like, yeah, I remember David writing that a thousand years ago. He says, that's Jesus. Remember when David said he would not let his body see correct? Well, it couldn't be David because David is still in the tomb. It was Jesus whom David was writing about. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, that's what I have my Bible open to, Isaiah 53, one of the most incredible prophecies. I encourage you to read the whole chapter later. We don't have time this morning. Uh, it's an incredible prophecy of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Also, Psalm 22 
an amazing chapter. The whole chapter is about Jesus and his death on the cross. When you read it, it sounds like a first-person account of the crucifixion, but it was written a thousand years ago. We don't have time to read through all of these chapters, but one thing I will emphasize in Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, it says the suffering servant will see a light and will be satisfied after anguish. Many scholars believe this indicates Jesus' resurrection. He suffered, but then was restored to light and restored after the anguish. And then Hosea 6, 2 metaphorically speaks about the nation of Israel revived on the third day. And so again, this is prophetic literature, so there's multiple layers. It's not only speaking about Israel, right? Because Jesus is the greater Israel. Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. It's talking about Jesus Christ. Early Christians knew that this prophecy in Hosea was foreshadowing Jesus' three days in the tomb and being resurrected. I could go on and on of the biblical prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. I just wanted to emphasize those three because they actually tie to the resurrection. But Jesus, long before this happened, foretold that it would happen. Also, it's central to apostolic teaching. This, guys, this wasn't an auxiliary point. It wasn't like, let me teach you about Christianity. Uh, it's, it's all about love and peace and hope. Oh, yeah, resurrection. Um, but really, really, just be a good neighbor. Like, no! Central to the apostolic teaching, the witnesses of the apostles, was he's alive. He came back from the dead, and you can too. Just place your faith on him. This is why in Romans, Paul said, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. What? God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. This was a core doctrine. This was not auxiliary. This was not secondary. And in, somehow in Christianity, we've made it so much about the cross, which I'm so thankful for the cross that atones for our sin. And we've made it so much about the New Testament exhortations of one another's love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another, correct one another. And those are incredible, and we need to do that. But somewhere we forgot about the empty tomb. I remember reading in John Eldridge's book, Waking the Dead. He says, why isn't the empty tomb the symbol of Christendom? The empty tomb, life after death, this, this was central to their preaching and to their teaching. And, and that's why today I felt the Lord say, just make it central again and I will draw all men to myself. If you can be convinced, fully convinced in your own mind, at least enough to take faith, there is faith. Because you weren't there, and you're trusting the accounts and the history, just like you have to have faith in any historical event. You have to have faith in the founding of this nation, and faith that George Washington was a real person. But because of the evidence and because of reality, you place your faith in those things and trust that it's real. I'm asking you to do the same thing with the resurrection, except this has implications far beyond your citizenship and far beyond your history books. This has implications for your soul. This has implications for where you spend eternity with God or separated from God. And God is the source of life and love and peace and joy. And if you separate from Him, you have the opposite of those things. You have anxiety and you have depression and you have torment and you have fear and you have hatred. And I don't want you to spend eternity unplugged from the source of life. I want you to spend it with Him in His good paradise forever, freely receiving the payment He made. It's a free gift for all who believe. This was a central message. It says in Acts 4.33, listen to this, with great power the apostles continued to testify to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's what they were testifying to. That's what they were preaching about. And God's grace was powerfully at work, adding to their number daily those who were saved. There's numerous eyewitness accounts. Look, 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus appeared to over 500 people at once. You might be saying, well, maybe the disciples hallucinated. It's kind of far-fetched to believe 12 guys hallucinated all at the same time, all at the same, seeing the same thing, but maybe they, you know, were in cahoots together, or maybe they were all on the same drug or something, who knows. But 500 people? Come on. There's no such thing as a mass hallucination of 500 people seeing the same thing. And, and Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians 15, these people are still alive. Go ask them. He's like, if you don't believe me, go ask them. Actually, I want to read 1 Corinthians 15. Bear with me. We're going to dive into this text. This will be our main text today. And then we're going to tie a bow on the sermon with 
some personal analysis and an action step for you. But 1 Corinthians 15, if you have your scriptures, you can turn there. This is the pinnacle text in defense of the resurrection. And if you wondered where I got this idea that it's all or nothing, it all hinges on this, well, Paul said it first. The Holy Spirit through Paul. So let's read this in verse 1. I'm going to put them up on the screen as well. Let me now remind you, this is Paul talking to the church in Corinth, a church that he started and planted and helped to grow by the Holy Spirit's leading. He's now writing back to them, and he says, let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters in this church, of the good news I preach to you. Guys, the resurrection is good news. You don't have to die and stay dead. You get to die and live again forever. This is good news. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it now. And that's what I pray for some of you that are more skeptical in the room. Welcome it, and then stand in it, and don't let anyone persuade you otherwise. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe. If you reject the good news, it doesn't apply to you. This happens, people say, well, that's, that doesn't seem very fair. Well, that's how all reality is. If you deny the existence of gravity and jump off this roof, it's not going to go well for you, right? Like what you affirm or deny in reality matters. If I denied my wife's love and covenant for me and I walked away from it, am I married to her any longer? No, because I'm, I'm not believe. If I believe it, she does love me and I receive it, we're going to live the rest of our lives together. Guess what I do? I stay in the covenant. She can't force me to be in a covenant with her against my will. That's kidnapping and God wouldn't do, God wouldn't do it either. So you have to freely respond. You have to freely believe. You have to freely trust. And it says, keep on believing. Continue to believe. Unless, of course, when you believed, you believed in vain. I passed on to you what was most important. This, guys, catch this. The Apostle Paul in Holy Scripture is telling you what's most important. <laughs> and that, that's a pretty big claim which was also passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. It's most important that you know that. What is sin? Everything you've done wrong, everything that you're not proud of, everything that God detests or doesn't like because he's a good God and doesn't want evil things in his world. Sin, right? All the things you're ashamed of. Lying, lusting, pride, envy, greed, on and on. Christ died for that. This is most important that you know Christ died for that. Just as the scripture said, he was buried. Why is it important that you know he was buried? That you, because we want you to know it was a real, historical, tangible thing. Not just a legend. And he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Paul's saying, guys, this is what's most important. If, if, if you only get one thing about Christianity, you must get this. He died and he rose again. You got to get it. It's most important. And then he says, verse 3, or sorry, verse 4, he was buried, or no, gosh, we're already in a five. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, here it is, he was seen by more than 500 followers at, this, at one time most of whom are still alive. You don't believe me? Go ask one of these 500 people. Though some have died. Verse 7, then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Guys, that's, that verse stands out to me because James was the brother of Jesus. Good luck convincing your biological brother that you're God. You know they didn't believe, right? His, his brothers did not believe him, but then something changed. And all of a sudden, James, the denier of Jesus, becomes the pastor in Jerusalem, the leader of, for Jesus. How do you convince your own brother that you're God and to become a pastor in your name? You come back from the dead. That's what you do. Verse 8, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. This is the Apostle Paul saying, I saw him on the road to Damascus with my own eyes. We're going to skip to verse 12, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are you, some of you saying that there's no resurrection of the dead? There were skeptics even back then. It's like it's a hard thing to believe. For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching is useless. Your faith 
is useless. Think about this. If you deny the resurrection, which God made you free, he gave you a choice, and you can choose to be ignorant if you want. What does it mean to be ignorant? To ignore. La, la, la. To ignore the truth. To suppress the truth in your unrighteousness. You can do that. But look, what, what you're, if, you're, if you claim that, you're saying every single person on the face of this planet that ever preached the gospel did it in vain. It was useless. I mean, that's, that's a big wager because there are people, countless people, that have given their entire lives to preach this message. You're also saying even those that had faith, not the preachers, not the Billy Grahams, not the evangelists, just any Christian and the two billion people out there in the world that claim this, they're all lying. That's what you're saying. He says it's useless. Listen to verse 15. And we apostles would be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. What, if you reject the resurrection, you consider all of the saints throughout the ages liars. That is astounding. It's a very prideful thing when you have the weight of history against you and the eyewitness testimony of hundreds against you and you're still going to deny it. In the court of law, it takes two eyewitnesses to sway a jury to convict someone of a crime. And we have hundreds and then millions if you count the encounters of people still alive today on the planet with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you're still guilty of your sins. If you deny the resurrections, my friend, you've got to deal with your own guilt. You have to deal with, what are you going to do with your lying and your fornicating and the pornography and the, and the bitterness and the malice and the unforgiveness? And what are you going to do with all this? It's there, and your conscience tells you it's there. And so you're going to have to suppress your conscience that's telling you to do something with this sin issue, but you won't have a Savior to bring it to. <laughs> This is torment. If you deny the resurrection, you live in the torment of your own sin because there's no one to pay for it. You're guilty of your own sin, verse 18. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if your hope in Christ is only for this life, listen to this. We Christians are to be more pitied than anyone in the world. You're calling Christendom pathetic. Pathetic. Pity is... Everything ever done in Christ's name, every hospital started, every school, every church, every mission, every well dug, everything ever done in the name of Christ, your Western society, America, you're writing it all off, right? And you're saying it's pathetic. You should be pitied. I mean, guys, it, this takes more faith to believe that there was no resurrection than to believe that there was. And then if that weren't enough, Paul continues, verse 30, or verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised. Listen to that, guys. In fact, not in theory, not in opinion, in fact, he has been raised. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died, and why should we ourselves risk our lives our? This is another apologetic defense. He's saying we risk our lives for this. Day by day by day, they never gave up. Why was Paul beaten and Paul shipwrecked and Paul stoned and Paul brutally rejected and whipped and scourged? Why? Why go through sleepless nights and harsh, harsh weather and stranded on islands? I mean, you guys have read the rap sheet of what Paul went through, and he says, if it's not for the resurrection, I wouldn't endure this stuff. 32, and what value was there in fighting wild beasts and those people in Ephesus if there's no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection, YOLO! Let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that's how most people live. Most people live just to have a good time, to get to the next party, the next high, the next adventure, because they're denying the resurrection and the realities of life after this one, the things that really matter, that are most important. 
I'm not saying you can never have a good time with family or to, God gave us good things to enjoy in this life, but when, what we do is we distract ourselves and we deny the fact of the resurrection so that way we, we can pretend that we don't have to deal with it. Don't be fooled. Look what Paul says in verse 33. Don't be fooled. If you deny the resurrection, it's going to be a harsh statement, but it, Paul said it first, you're fooled. You're fooled. Someone tricked you. Probably Satan. Don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company corrects, corrupts good character. Interesting quote. He quotes the Proverbs. What does character have to do with the resurrection? Because more than likely, the reason you don't want to deal with the fact that Jesus came back from the dead is because you have a vice. And the people around you that are convincing you, Jesus isn't real. Jesus didn't come back from the dead. Well, they love their vices too. So they're corrupting you with the bad character. Very interesting connection. Verse 34, think carefully about what is right. Stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you do not know God at all. Guys, this is the most powerful verse, I think, in this whole block of Scripture, and I didn't even catch it till I was preparing for this message. Look what Paul is saying. If you don't know the resurrection is real, there's only a few things you've got to do, my friends. Think carefully. That's what we're doing today. Examine. Think. Use your brain. Study history. It is real. Second, stop sinning. Your sin, the Bible says we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. La, 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 la. We don't want to hear what God is saying because we'd rather be God of our own lives and keep doing what we want to do even though it's killing us, but we think we like it. We have the love-hate relationship with sin, and we'd rather have that toxic cesspool than actually come to the Creator who made us so He can free us from it. That's what Paul says. Stop sinning. You'll be able to think clearly. Guys, I'm telling you, if you're not able to think clearly about the resurrection, maybe it's because you got so much sin in your life. And then lastly, some of you do not know God at all. I'm telling you, I just want to submit this to you. If you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you do not know God. If you do not live as if Jesus is actually alive right now, you don't know him. You might ascribe to a religion, right? You might give him the platitudes and placate to him and virtue signal and and go to even pay homage and go to church on Christmas and Easter. But unless you live, live in action and in reality as if Jesus is alive right now, you don't know God. That's the claim of the Apostle Paul. Some, Some of you don't know God at all. That's why you're saying there's no resurrection. Because if you know there, if you know God, you know he came back from the dead. Everything we believe hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. It vindicates his teachings. It validates his sacrifice. And it vouches for his promise of life beyond the grave. Last but not least, fourth quarter, personal analysis. What does this have to do with me, Rob, this event 2,000 years ago in history, the resurrection? Okay, I get it. You're stacking up all the evidence, and I see it. But okay, Okay, so what? I'm a 21st century American, modern day person. What what does this have to do with me? Well, my friends, if you actually place your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can become a new creation. And there's no greater hope than looking in the mirror and actually respecting the person that you have become. Than knowing you're not who you used to be. And you don't have to stay prey to the patterns throughout the generations of all humanity that have wreaked havoc in your family lines. You can set a new course. You can have a new mind. You can have a new heart with new desires and a new legacy. This is the hope of the gospel. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. If, you're, if you are in the room and you're like, I need a reset. Man, I, wanna, I don't want to be the old person. I want a new season, a new life, a new marriage, a new family. It's only in Christ. Anything else is fleeting. You might have a new kick. You might replace one bad habit with another, but the only way to truly transform from the inside out is through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. 
Ezekiel 26, 36, 26 says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I'll put it within you and I'll remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Some of you today, there's a heart of stone, a hardness, maybe from hurt, from trauma, from pain, skepticism. You're grouchy. You're cold. God says, I I can take that from you. I can give you a new heart of flesh, a heart that's soft and warm and kind and understanding and open and curious, a truth explorer rather than a dogmatic denier. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, notice the word new, renewing of your mind, that by testing you can discern what is God's will, good, acceptable, and perfect, God's will. God wants you to know Him, and He wants you to know what He wants for you, and He's a good dad, and He wants good things for you, but the only way you can know His will is, God, what do you want me to do with my business? What do you want me to do with my marriage? What do you want me to do with my finances? What do you want me to do? The only way you can know that is a new mind. You have to change the way you think, and the only way you get a new mind is by faith in Christ, in the resurrection power. You trust Jesus and he begins to renew it. And there's multiple ways he renews it. Scripture, the church, worship music, prayer. But more than important in the how is the intention of the what. I'm committed to getting a new mind. You'll figure out the how. People lack the commitment. They lack the conviction. And that's why they never figure out the how. The disciples I've had that know that they know that they know they want it, they're hungry, well, I can teach them everything else. <laughs> Here's this book. Oh, already read it two months later. Oh, great. Okay, here's another one. Oh, go to the prayer and worship. Oh, already did it. Oh, okay, well, you need to forgive these family members. Boom, already did it. Because they're hungry. It's the ones that are apathetic, that don't actually want it. You can give them all the resources and training and teaching and admonition and love and support, and it goes nowhere. Because they don't actually want it. They're not hungry. So I'm, I'm asking you, don't worry about how you become a new creation and how you get a new heart and how you get a, n- a new mind, all the mechanics. Just trust it that it will happen. If you believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that he died and rose again, you become new. It is hap- trust me, I am not who I used to be. God totally transformed me from 16 years old in a jail cell, rebelling against authority to... 33 preaching to you today about the resurrection of Jesus. He can do that for you. Secondly, personal analysis, hope after death. The resurrection assures us that pain and death are not the end. What does this have to do with me today? What does this have to do with you today? Because death is still coming. Unless you live to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will die. There will be a funeral There will be people weeping and mourning for you. That day will come as sure as the sunrise. And you only have so many breaths left as time passes. So why does this pertain to you? Because don't you want to live? Don't you want to live after you die? We can distract ourselves and pretend like death's not coming, but eventually we have these reality check moments. I remember when I was in high school, my pastor was going into high school. My first pastor died of cancer. What a reality check. This man gave his life to the the ministry of the church and still passed away, and I was so mad at God. I was actually bitter at God, and that led me to the rebellion and led me to sitting in that jail cell and just the angst in my soul that, well, what good it did my pastor, he died of cancer, and he gave his life to God. And it wasn't until I actually believed in the resurrection. I remember I was in worship my freshman year of high school at a retreat, and God showed me a vision of the great cloud of witnesses. And Pastor Zenon was in the great cloud of witnesses. In fact, he's watching right now. And when I saw that, and the Lord showed me, was it not better for him to be with me, Rob? And I said, Yes, it was. He said, how selfish of you that you thought it would be better for him to stay down here. I released it. I said, Lord, forgive me for harboring offense towards you. 
and I'm going to carry on his legacy rather than to deny you. The power of the resurrection convinced me that Jesus was worth living for even when my first pastor died of cancer. I don't care what loss you're facing or what pain you're facing or what suffering you're facing. If you know the hope of the resurrection, it all makes sense because you know this, it's not all about this life. It gives answer to the suffering. It's like, oh, well, this is just temporal, and that's what matters. Romans 3.23 say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory. That means we're, we're all in this mess together. We're all going to die. I remember also in high school of a football friend of ours, Casey, passed away unexpectedly in his sleep of an enlarged heart. And I remember passing by his casket. It was such a sobering time as a high schooler to think about these things, life and death. And like I said, it has a way of sneaking up on you. And I realized, what am I doing with my life? Living for myself and my own pleasures and distracted in high school? Like, this life is real. Death is my friend just died. That could be me. That could be any one of these people. I need to share the gospel. I need to think about eternity. I need to get serious about my faith. And his death actually sparked. It was, it was part of what helped to spark what we still call to this day the revival. As we led Bible studies and prayer nights and these, and these high school football dudes came together and we saw many students saved and lives transformed. But it was because we realized there's hope after death. Casey, I remember looking at his body thinking, that's not him. That... <laughs> He's in the great cloud of witnesses. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. God, you guys are earning your payment. You're earning your keep, and that is death. All of us are. We've all lied. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short, and it's earning us some, it's wages, just like a paycheck you get, that direct deposit you get in your account. Well, God's direct deposit for you, for your lusting and your lying and your stealing his direct deposit to you is death. And we're all going to inherit that death. The question is, will you stay dead and inherit the second death of separation from God? Or will you pass through the first death? And that's why Jesus calls it sleeping. Because if you die, but you live in Christ, resurrected with a new body with him forever, it's as if you fell asleep and then you're transformed in the twinkling of an eye. This is the hope, the free gift of God. Free gift. Wages, you earn death. Gift, you don't earn because Jesus earned it for you. It's free, but it's not cheap. It's very expensive. This free gift came at the price of his son, came at the price of the blood of the lamb. Very expensive, but it's free to you. All you have to do is receive it. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Lastly, freedom in Christ. When you believe and receive the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not only do you become a new person, not only do you have hope of life after death forever, you have freedom, freedom from sin. Look at this, John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The hope of the gospel isn't just that one day you get fire insurance and one day you get to be with Jesus forever. That's true. But it's also that right now you can overcome your hurts, your hangups, and your habits. All of your sin patterns, you can conquer them. You can be free of sin, of Satan. When he comes to tempt you, you can crush him under your feet, walking in authority and power. You can be free of yourself. When you sabotage yourself and you have those limiting beliefs, you can overcome them in the name of Jesus. Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Guys, before Jesus, it's slavery. Why does this matter to you? Why does the resurrection matter? Because anything else is slavery. You think you're so free apart from Jesus? You're slaves to the pattern of this world. You just do whatever the culture and your scrolling social media tells you to do and tells you to buy. And you do whatever your carnal cravings for, want, want you to do. You're not free apart from Christ. You're in bondage. And it's, you trick yourself into thinking 
that you're free and you're the God of your own life. But really, you're just slave to Satan and all of his patterns and you're slave to sin and you're a slave to the culture. But in Christ, you can be free never to go back again to the yoke of slavery. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him, this is why it matters to you. Catch this verse. If you don't hear anything else today, listen to this verse. If the spirit of of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give you life and life to your mortal bodies through the spirit that dwells in you. Guys, why am I up here preaching today? I want you to have life. I don't want you to have death. Your way of relating apart from God, it only brings death, death to your future, death to your relationships, death to your hope, but in Christ, you can have life, life in your relationships, life for your future, and life in your hope of the resurrection. So I'm going to conclude with this. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus and the resurrection, and today something clicked for you, and you feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, and you say, yes, this is true. This is true. I've been denying it, but it's true. I want to give you an opportunity to commit by faith in Jesus, to believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, that you trust his payment on your behalf, but you also trust that he came back from the dead. I'm asking you, like a hand of poker, put all your chips, (laughs) bet your entire livelihood on the resurrection. Maybe you would say, yeah, Rob, I, I believe in Jesus. I already know these things. But maybe you don't live like you do. Like reality betrays you because you say you believe this stuff. And yet, this reality of the resurrection demands more than agreement, right? It demands alignment and allegiance. Align your life. Is there anything in your life that's out of alignment with God's will and God's word? Because if you say the resurrection's true, you should probably listen to this man who came back from the dead and align yourself with him and pledge allegiance to his way and his will and start making disciples and spreading the gospel and carry out his mission on earth. Do you truly live as if Jesus is God and he is alive and that his words and commands matter? Or do you live just your own life and then you kind of pay homage to Jesus once in a while? Guys, he's, he won't be fooled on the day of judgment. It's like, well, Lord, Lord, I... I believed in you. Well, but your life didn't. Your words might have. I ask you to consider if the resurrection is true, shouldn't you take God more seriously? You'll be judged not by your pretense or nostalgia or tradition. (laughs) Well, we went to church once in a while or I thought I was a Christian, or it was really warm and cozy feelings when I thought about the resurrection and Easter Sunday. That's not what you're going to be judged on. You're going to be judged on your faith. And I'm not talking about just intellectual belief. I'm talking about the faith that produces life-altering action. Faith that produces life-altering action, full devotion and full surrender to King Jesus. So as we close, hold fast to the resurrection. Allow this truth again this morning to penetrate your heart and penetrate your mind. Jesus is alive. And he doesn't want to only be alive on the throne because he is, and nothing you do will change that. He wants to be alive in your heart. And only you can make that happen. (laughs) So let's pray.